Welcome to the Open Forum, a telephone talk program designed to give you the opportunity to ask questions and discuss issues related to the Bible. Our host is Harold Camping of Family Stations Incorporated. The phone number is 1-800-322-5385. That's 1-800-322-5385. When you call, allow the phone to keep ringing. Your call will be answered when it is time for you to be on the air. When your call is taken, please be ready to turn your volume down. Our phone number is 1-800-322-5385. Now we present Open Forum with our host and Bible teacher, Harold Camping. Good evening. How are you tonight? Again, may I have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while. What would you like to talk about this evening on this anonymous telephone program? What subject is of concern to you? The Bible is the Word of God, and that is the book that we use on this program as our authority, as our resource book, as our guide, as our everything, because it is the Word of God. It's just beyond our imagination that God, holy God, who created this world, could give in our hands a book in which he has laid out all the rules, all the laws by which he wants mankind to live by. And he created us with a mind so and the ability to read and to think so that we can read these things. And as we read the word of God, we are hearing God speak to us because it, uh, this Word of God, this Bible, is really the voice of God speaking to us. And therefore, what a privilege, what a magnificent thing, idea this is, that on a program like this we can use the Bible as our authority. Well, this is your program. Now, before we take our first call from our telephone lines, we have a question that comes from mainland China. We have a great many listeners there because we broadcast by FAM radio 24 hours a day, and that reaches a great percentage of all the provinces of mainland China. And we also broadcast by shortwave radio, and that reaches all of the provinces of mainland China. And here is the question. According to the biblical law, we should work six days and rest on the seventh day, which is Sunday, right? So on Sunday, can we go to the shop, do shopping, go to the restaurant to eat, do our housework, visit friends, and so on and so on? Good question. Good practical question. Just what is Sunday? You know, in the Old Testament, God uh, simply... Uh, set up the seventh day, one day out of seven, it was Saturday in the Old Testament days, uh, as a day when no work was to be done. So automatically it was a day that was used for worship and and uh, God's things, or it should have been used that way. Uh, but the reason for it was that uh, they, this was pointing to the fact that we are not to do any work to get ourselves saved. God has done all the work. It's grace alone. But when Christ went to the cross, those kind of ceremonial laws, like the seventh-day Sabbath and the burnt offering and the blood sacrifices, were completed in Him. He, he became our Savior. Uh, that is, we can, rec- we can uh, read about Him and know that Indeed, he went to the cross to pay for the sins of all those that he came to save. But even though it was the end, therefore, of those ceremonial laws, it is still God's plan that the human race should have one day out of seven as a day for spiritual activity. Bear in mind that God has created us. He knows exactly how we are created. Uh, He is intimately uh, uh, involved in who we are because he created us. And he knows full well about the uh, blandishments, the enticements, the excitement 
of this world and how we can become interested in the things of this world and forget all about a relationship with God. And therefore, God, right from the beginning, established this rule. Work six days, have one day for spiritual activity. In the Old Testament, it served a dual purpose. It, it gave a day for spiritual activity, but also it gave a day in which, which was focusing on the fact we're not to work for our salvation. Therefore, in the New Testament, as soon as Christ rose from the grave and the ceremonial laws of the Old Testament were not to be observed any longer, God introduced another day of, uh, of worship. Only now he set it on a different day of the week. Instead of making it the seventh day, he made it the first day, the day we call Sunday. So there would be no mix-up as to the fact that it's a different kind of a day than the Old Testament Sabbath day. The first day of the week Sabbath is not a sign. It's not a part of the ceremonial law. It is not pointing to some aspect of our salvation. It is strictly a day that is, is something that God expects us to observe for our own good as we glorify him. And God set the rule in uh, the statement as to how we are to observe it in Isaiah 58, verse 13. Isaiah 58, verse 13. If thou turn thy foot from the Sabbath, he's talking here about the Sunday Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath of the light, the holy of the Lord, uh, honorable, and shalt honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words, then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord. Here God is indicating what the Sunday Sabbath is to be. It is a day of doing God's good pleasure, not our own. Going shopping on Sunday is for our pleasure, not for God's pleasure. Therefore, no, don't do that. Are going to restaurants on Sunday in order to do as the world does and have a time of enjoyment for ourselves? No. Uh, that is uh, not pleasing God. That is seeking our own pleasure. It is a day when we are thinking, how can I particularly serve God on this day? In order for us to uh, know a little more precisely what would be pleasing to God, it's interesting. It was the first day of the week that God began creation when he said, let there be light. That, that statement is already anticipating the time when the gospel would go all over the world. And that identifies with the first day. Now, how can we be the light of the world? And why? Uh, how can we particularly be the light of the world on Sunday, the day when we are doing God's good pleasure? We can as we, as we pray for others, as we share the gospel with others, as we pass out tracts if we have a supply of them. Uh, as we uh, invite people to listen to family radio, as we uh, invite uh, friends over to, t to talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the way we become a light bearer, bearer on that day. It's also interesting, you know, it was on that day that Christ rose from the grave, and he is the first of the first fruits. He is the evidence that now there's going to be salvation for the world. And, and indeed, on Pentecost, that came seven weeks later, that was a Sunday again, a, sa a Sunday Sabbath, and about 3,000 are saved. So we know that sharing the gospel is a big and important part of uh, the observance of Sunday. It's a day for spiritual wor worship. It's a day for reading the Bible, for talking with our children about the things of the Lord, for singing God's praises, for uh, any kind of spiritual activity. We need it. 
We need it. We don't have to deceive ourselves and think, oh, well, I get enough of that during the week. God has established the routine, and that is what we are to follow. We are to look upon each Sunday as an opportunity, a grand opportunity. Today, I don't have to think about my work. I don't have to think about painting my house. I don't have to think about uh, making a living. I don't have to think about any of those things. However bad it's gone during the week, this is the day I can focus entirely on the Lord Jesus Christ. I can spend as much time as I can uh, in reading the Bible and talking to my family about the Bible and and all the other things. And this is the way God has designed us. We need that so that on Monday morning we're ready again to face the workaday world because we've had this spiritual interlude We've had this spiritual break in which to rekindle this spiritual fires, if you will. That is to uh, be, uh, to again uh, get our focus back on the Lord where it ought to be and where it kind of strayed from because of the difficulties we faced throughout the workday week. Well, thank you, China, for that very good question. And now shall we go to our first caller on our telephone lines. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Campy. How are you? Very well, thank you. Brother Campy, I've been listening to you for a while, and I don't presume to know the Bible as well as you do. I'm like on spiritual milk. But don't you think that... Um, like all of the fighting over different denominations uh, in our Christian uh, faith is, is, is like working against what God wants us to do. Because I hear you talk sometime, like say about a particular denomination, Pentecostal. And when people speak about that denomination, it's like you go ballistic. Well, excuse me, I don't think I go ballistic. I think that's a little exaggerating. But the fact is, my desire is that people might become saved. And if they are tied into a religion that is not the true gospel, then they're in an environment where they're not going to become saved. And, uh, and you know, it's, uh, this is not a program where we're just trying to be nice to everyone and say nice things and make people feel good. This program is designed to bring the truth. You have to remember that we're living in a very, very um, uh, difficult world. We're, we're uh, going to end up in heaven or in hell. Uh, this, is, this life is very, very serious. Now, when we're out in the workplace, or we're uh, going to school, or we're uh, um, uh, going for a vacation or something, we don't get into these serious matters. We're just one. We're just enjoying this world as it is, or or trying to get along in this world as it is. But at some point, we have to face reality that this world. There's more to this world than just our pleasure or or making money or trying to find uh, a, a nice place to live we are we have to think about the future there is a an eternity stretching out in front of us and where are we going to spend that and this is the kind of a program where we face that issue all the time and so if i really love people yeah, and I and I'm telling them, well, what you're, I don't agree with you, but it's okay. Just go ahead and do that, and so on. Then I'm showing I don't love them. I I don't care at all about them. I don't care if they go to hell. That's up to that's the between them and the Lord. But I do care. I care very greatly. It's no fun to to talk about judgment day and talk about eternal damnation and talk about what the true gospel is. Uh, it's uh, it's because I know I'm stepping on toes, but how can I do elsewise if I really love people and want the very best for them? 
um, I can respect that, sir. But it's like, I, I, maybe I'm misconstruing what you say. But do you like you don't you don't think people should like praise and worship God like with music? Isn't that what they do in heaven, twenty four hours a day, seven days? Well, a week? excuse me, you never hear me saying not to use music. I talk about music all the time, that we sing songs of praise to the Lord. But uh, but we but uh, there there is music and there is music. And and if we're going to talk about music, let's talk about music as God talks about it. Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So, yeah, music that is uh, hopefully identified with the kingdom of God and not with the, with the world. And so uh, there, it's not a matter of music, it's a matter of what kind of music. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Hello. Yes. Um, I have a question from uh, Revelation, the 10th chapter. Yes. Uh, my question has to do with a little book. Uh, I think it's um, located in Revelation 10 and... Uh, starting with verse 8, I'd like to know what is the significance of this little book that he had to eat and it was um, sweet in his mouth and yes. bitter in his belly? Yes. Uh, give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it eat, and eat it up. It shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many people, peoples and nations and tongues and kings. The little book is the completion, we have to understand that, I believe, uh, to be the completion of God's revelation. Now, the fact is, God's whole revelation of mankind is in the Bible. There is no further messages coming from God once the Bible was completed and the Bible was completed about 1900 years ago uh, but the understanding of the Bible is a progressive understanding it, we could call that progressive revelation that is even though it's been written about and it's there it's been there for 1900 years we don't necessarily understand everything and there are things that are that still must happen that uh, for most of these past 1900 years have not been been clearly understood at all uh, and uh, but at some point they are going to be understood and particularly those things that have to do with uh, the, the time in which we're living right now as we approach the end of the world are, are all the information that has to do with the great tribulation all the information that has to do with the latter rain that follows on the heels or is, uh, be, begins that, uh, during that time of great tribulation uh, that is all part of the little book I do believe it's, uh, it was not uh, it, you notice it says in verse 11 thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. That is, there's going to be a final message. It's all been written in the Bible. It's been there for 1,900 years, but it has not been understood. And uh, until in our day, because we're near the end, and uh, the, we can expect that a lot of verses that we previously did not understand now are coming to understand. You know, we're coming to understand them. Uh -huh. Okay, could I ask you one other question, please? Yes. Um, Revelation, the 11th chapter and the 13th verse. Um, could you explain that verse in particular when it says the remnant were frighted and gave glory? Who are the remnant? Yes. And the same hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth part of the uh, city fell, and in the earthquake were slain of men 7,000, and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to God of heaven. 
You see, the remnant, and normally the remnant, have to do with those who are the true believers. They are the ones who give glory to God. Uh, they are the ones who fear God. Fear God. Notice in, in uh, when the uh, when the uh, uh, two witnesses are who stand on their feet. We read in verse uh, in in. Uh, in verse um, mm, yeah, in, in, in verse um, eleven, verse eleven, there it is. After three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. The characteristic of the true believer is that he fears God. He uh, he knows that God is almighty God. He knows that except for the mercy of God, he would be under the wrath of God, that he deserves the wrath of God. And so we tremble before God. That's why we read in uh, Philippians chapter 2, work out your salvation, that is the salvation God has provided, with fear and trembling. And so as uh, as the, these end time things are happening, uh, the true believers are, 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 are filled with fear, but they're giving glory to God. They are the remnant, I do believe. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next one? Hello, Brother Cammie. Yes. How do you do, sir? Very well, thank you. Good. Um, I'd like to ask you... Um, we're in Revelation, uh, chapter 18, yeah. uh, verse 4, um, yeah. yes. through 6. Revelation 18, verse 4, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues, for her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double, according to her works in the cup, which she hath filled, filled to her double. Now, what is your question? Um, now, this uh, refers to, to the woman, right, sir? This refers to the harlot Babylon, which in turn is a figure here or a picture of the churches and congregations that have uh, that God regards as being adulterous uh, even as he speaks of them in James chapter 4 ye adulterers ye adulterers and adulteresses and uh, and uh, now they have uh, become a harlot particularly uh, called Babylon because Satan is ruling in in these churches and congregations so now it has become the citadel they have become the citadel or the palace of satan himself and that's why they are now called babylon right is this um some of the meaning sir which has to uh tell us to become out of the church oh this absolutely is you see actually the whole world is babylon in another sense uh, because Satan is the ruler of the whole world, uh, and and yet we can't come out of this world. That's an impossibility. As a matter of fact, we are to be in the world as uh, ambassadors of Christ, representing the kingdom of God, and and sharing the gospel with the world. And we don't serve uh, the uh, uh, Satan in any way. But within the church, where Satan now is ruling, those within the church serve and worship the one who is the king there. And if Satan is the king, whether they like it or not, or whether they recognize it or not, this is the one that they are serving. And more than that, God insists that the Holy Spirit has come out of the midst. And the only midst that, uh, when God talks about God in the midst, it's always talking about where the believers ought to be. Now, the the uh, fa fact is, now, that Babylon, uh, that Babylon we have to come out of. Uh, she has become a, 
that Babylon has become a harlot and uh, all together in God's sight and we are to not be there any longer be, and it's for our protection in actuality totally for our protection because that, that's a dangerous place to be now given the fact that the Holy Spirit is not in the midst there saving people as he's not applying the Word of God to anybody's lives and so uh, sna Satan is snatching that word away from those who hear it as we read in uh, in the parable of the sower that went to, forth to sow and and there is no salvation possible but on the other hand we have the vast assurance from the Bible that outside of the churches there's a great multitude which no man can number that are coming into the body of Christ. I, I had found a Lord also outside the church myself, and uh, I was just reading that. It, it all kind of ties into me now, so I really appreciate you spending the time and going over that with me. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Harold? Yes. Yes, um, and, uh, what day was uh, Eve created? Well, in principle, she was created when Adam was. If you go back to Genesis chapter 1, uh, where God is talking about the creation of Adam, it's very uh, interesting. And remember, every word in the Bible is crafted by God. He designed uh, these words. It's uh, These are not from the pen of a human that's just trying to uh, guess what God wants. Here's what God says in verse 27 of Genesis 1. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female, created he them. Now, this is at the time, on the sixth day of creation. In actuality, it only Adam was created on that sixth day, and it was some weeks later, or some, a little bit of time later, that God caused Adam to go into a deep sleep, and then he took a rib from Adam and formed Eve, his wife. But in principle, Eve had all, the woman had already been created because she was part of, of Adam, and the rib, uh, by taking the, uh, the, the rib from Adam and making uh, of, of that rib Eve indicated that she was already in existence, not not as a woman actually, but as a rib in Adam, uh, and this creation would have occurred on the sixth day. And thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Mr. Campy. Yes. I just turn it off to the radio. Turn your radio off, please. Okay. Um, I've heard the verse quoted over the last... Oh, excuse me. Excuse me. Hold on. I'll be right back with you right after this message. Okay. Day at this time, we bring you Open Forum. A telephone. We read in 1 Corinthians that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. That is, they should be able to spend all their time and enjoy sharing the gospel. In the body of Christ, we all have our calling, our gifts, our duties. Some are called to preach, some are called to serve. Some are called to provide the means by which others can share the gospel. If our Lord has enabled you to share financially that the gospel can go forth, consider sharing a love offering to Family Radio for this month's need. We desire to continue concentrating our efforts on sharing the gospel here and around the world. Our address for your kind help is Family Radio, Oakland, California, 94621. That's Family Radio, Oakland, California, 94621. Thank you. 
We continue with more of the open forum. You are invited to call in and ask questions or discuss issues that are related to the Bible. Our number is 1-800-322-5385. That's 1-800-322-5385. When your call goes on the air, please be ready to turn your volume down. Here is our host and Bible teacher, Harold Camping. We have a caller on the line. Go ahead with your call, please. For years I've heard the verse uh, quoted, a vast number which no man can count. And I've always thought that was referring to the fact that man was unable to sort out the number. But a couple of days ago, it dawned on me that that Versus really saying, only God can I identify the true believers. So he's the only one that can count, count them. Well, that is true, of course, that God is the only one who knows the true believers. But it's also true that there's a change in God's uh, uh, methodology in getting the gospel out for 19 over 1900 years about a little over 1950 years as a matter of fact God has uh, the methodology has been through the churches and congregations that's been the main way in which he shared the gospel and and in these churches numbers are kept and the number of confessions of faith the number of people in the in the cradle roll, the number of baptisms, the number of this and the number of that, the number of mission subjects and a mission post someplace, numbers are kept. But it's also true that uh, in this day uh, of the latter reign, it's impossible to keep any numbers, any numbers. We, for example, just to use family radio as an illustration, we send the gospel out by radio, and we haven't the slightest idea how many people listen or how many people are becoming saved or where they are. We, we know that they're all over the world because we get uh, sample letters and, uh, from people all over the world. But how many? Uh, we we have no idea. No one can number them, and and uh, we know that that also fits because uh, we're living in a uh, we're uh, living in the day of the latter rain when when the church age has come to an end. Although in another sense, technically speaking, you do have a point. Of course, that that uh, no one can number the true believers. Even during the church age, nobody knows the exact number of the true believers. We have no idea what the number of the true believers is. But, uh, but the fact is that the setting of that verse, after this I saw a great multitude, and so on, who came out of great tribulation, clearly tells us that this is talking about those who are saved outside of the churches in the time of the latter reign as we our God is finishing the evangelization of the world in the, by that method. And uh, that last caller that talked about uh, how uh, the Pentecostals should be included with the Christians, well, I don't believe that because I don't believe Pentecostals can are true Christians. They may be until they're saved, but after they're saved, they don't stay there. Yeah, well, the fact is that that uh, uh, if we're if we're going to follow a gospel, we want to make sure it is the gospel that is uh, structured by the Bible alone, is circumscribed by the Bible alone, uh, and in its entirety. Because if it's any other kind of a divine authority, then we're in violation of Revelation 22 verses 18 and 19 and that would mean we're, 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 there's no possibility of salvation in that kind of a gospel but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum how you doing very well thank you uh, I have a question I, I have read 
Psalms 37, and it very clearly says that the earth really isn't going to disappear, but only the wicked will be judged and and removed. How do you feel about that? Well, the, you see, th there's a principle that you have to keep in mind, and that is that we always compare Scripture with Scripture. And any time we read a verse and decide that this verse is saying thus and so, we don't really know whether we have the right conclusion unless we test it against the rest of the, of the Word of God. Now, it's true that there are verses that appear to emphasize that this earth will continue everlastingly. But on the other hand, what then do we do with a passage like Second Peter chapter 3, where God says very clearly, very clearly in Second Peter chapter 3, that uh, uh, verse 7, the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly man. And then it goes on. The day of the Lord, in verse 10, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. So how do we how can we reconcile this with these verses that seem to indicate the earth will continue forevermore? Well we reconcile it if we see how God speaks. For example, here is a believer uh, and we have been given everlasting life, uh, eternal life at the moment we became saved and yet our bodies are put in the tomb when we die and return to the dust. Where's the everlasting life? But the fact is, the Bible teaches that on the last day, our bodies are going to be resurrected, a, a new glorified body. And so that, in principle, yes, we, our, our bodies continue evermore. But there's a, a break, there's a change in our bodies, but it's still our body. That continues forevermore. The same is true of the earth. The earth is burned up, but I saw new heavens and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So the earth continues, only now it is a glorified earth. And, and, and that's why God can say, for example, in Matthew 5, that the meek, the humble, shall inherit the earth. I... You know, the religion that I once was affiliated with believes that the 144,000 are of the brighter Christ and that the, that the group which, uh, which are called the great crowd, which no man can number, were earthly and would remain here on the earth. Now, I'm not saying that the heavens had remained. We could probably move to another area or, as it says, that, that, that God would become the light or the, 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 the sun. But I, it, it seems to indicate that the, that the planet itself is not to be destroyed. In other words, well, the may, actual physical planet. Well, they, that may appear to be what it seems like, but that isn't what Second Peter 3 is talking about. He says in verse 12, Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. You know, the question is, are we going to listen to the Word of God, or are we going to listen to the philosophies of men? There are people in that particular denomination, as there are people in every kind of a denomination, that uh, look at a few verses here or there and, and, and arrive at what they think is a, a reasonable conclusion, and then they write extensively about it, and because they're very highly regarded, uh, they're looked upon as if they have really got the truth. But uh, their, their work can be tested by the Bible. And, and uh, that kind of an idea that this planet won't be dissolved just won't hold water at all. Not at all. It's, uh, it's, there isn't the slightest possibility that there's any truth in that. Incidentally, in the minute that we see that, they're, that they've gone completely haywire on they're all together wrong on that idea, then the next thing we wonder, well, what about a lot of other things they're teaching? And as a matter of fact, a lot of other things they're teaching are also entirely contrary to the Bible. 
I thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Camping. How yes. are you this evening? Very well, thank you. Brother Camping, um, my question is, when something terrible happens to a person like myself, um, and it's a terrifying experience, uh, you become numb, and ever since it happened, I haven't felt very happy. And I haven't been reading my Bible like I, I used to. Well, and you've had a terrifying experience because of what? Um, I was in a car and someone else was driving. Yes. And it was a terrifying experience that happened at a cemetery. And, um... You mean, did you have an accident of some kind? Yes. Driving over a grave. Yes. But what is your question about this? Uh, well, I want to know, how can I get back on track for reading my Bible and feeling better? Well, you know, when, we, uh, when we're completely upset because of a traumatic experience like you must have had, uh, our, our, suddenly we feel very insecure, suddenly we wonder we're... Uh, what, where was God and all of these things and, and the, 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 uh, where is the, where is the foundation of truth? Where is there something that is solid that we can hang on to? The Bible. The Bible. So you start reading the Bible and, and first of all, thank the Lord that you that went through this and you survived it and, and uh, and obviously God cared for you and took care that you were not killed in this accident or fatally in, or severely injured. And but now get your eyes focused back on the Lord and and uh, and in fact, you know the Bible says in Philippians chapter four verse six, don't be anxious about anything. But with prayer and supplication, prayer is talking with God. Supplication means we're begging, we're beseeching. We are imploring the Lord for his strength, for his help. But then the next phrase, uh, that work out your, no, uh, 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 don't, um, <laughs> out of that verse go, I uh, don't be anxious about anything, but with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your request known to the Lord. Do you have anything to be thankful for? My, yes, you survived. You came out of it. You, and now you can continue to read the Word of God and, and get your eyes focused back on the Lord Jesus. And when this dreadful experience comes into your mind, say, Oh Lord, oh Lord, I, I thank Thee that Thou hast, hast protected me through this and cared for me. And now, O oh Lord, help me to live even more faithfully for Thee. And thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Mr. Camping, there was a previous caller that was dealing with Second Peter 3. Actually, he was talking about the earth abiding forever. And yes. I wanted to discuss that chapter a little bit with you, if that's okay. Yes. I do believe that uh, the Scripture teaches that the earth shall abide forever because that's what the Bible clearly says. And I do not believe in following the philosophies of men or usurping ideas. Well, excuse me, excuse me. What does Second Peter chapter 3 say? Well, what does Second Peter chapter 3 say? I tell you what it says, Mr. Camping. Yes. Okay. If we look at the full context and do a good exegesis of the scripture rather than an eisegesis where we are taking a scripture out of context and not looking at the full context, we see in verses coming up to the verse that you were quoting in verse 10, if we look at verse 5, it talks about a world and an earth that was prior. It was the antediluvian world and earth, and it says that that world perished. 
that earth perished. So the scriptures clearly point out that there are different ages or different worlds, different earths. There was an antediluvian earth, there is a post-diluvian earth, and there will be a millennial earth, and there will be a new heavens and a new earth at the end of the thousand years and a little season. So we need to look at the Bible and the Bible alone and not let... Well, excuse me. Oh, now, excuse me. Now, uh, you're talking about a thousand years. Where, where do you read about a thousand years that this world is still going to continue? Where do you read that? I know you, I know you read Revelation 20, but that isn't talking about a future thousand years. Uh, you, you are putting a lot of things into this. The fact is that the world that existed in the days of Noah was totally destroyed. Except for those who were with Noah in the ark, and the Bible is very clear about how that happened. We don't have to guess. Uh, read Revelation or uh, Genesis 6 and 7 and 8 very clearly. God does discuss that. But we also, and when you talk about context, we have to look at the whole Bible as the context. What does God say in Romans chapter, uh, chapter eight, uh, where He says that this this uh, uh, this uh, whole creation waits for the uh, uh, the uh, revealing of the sons of glory, so it can be be set free from the bondage of decay, the bondage of vanity that it now is under. And, and uh, as it talks about a new heaven and a new earth here, not only here, but in Isaiah, for example, of a new heaven and a new earth. And so if you want to think that this present sin-cursed earth with its volcanoes and earthquakes and all of these things are going to continue, you may do so. But this language is very clear, very clear looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved. Or as it says in verse 10, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat and the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. If that isn't plain language, I don't know what plain language is. It, and it fits everything else that we read in the Bible. The, uh, the, when the Bible says the meek shall inherit the earth, it will not be this sin cursed earth with all of its uh, 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 earthquakes and tornadoes and, uh, and uh, uh, thorns and thistles, uh, an earth that has been cursed. It's going to be a perfect earth and it'll be united with heaven. I saw he a, a new heaven and a new earth. A Christ, we will be with Christ forevermore. But yes, yeah. Uh, in looking at the uh, the clear verbiage there in, in uh, Second Peter three, you're correct. It does clearly say that the elements shall be dissolved, and there shall be a new heavens and a new earth. But it also says that there was a an earth that was prior to the earth that the apostles were living in. That was the antediluvian earth. Well, excuse me, I've just indicated that God, we, we can learn all about that antediluvian earth. The Bible gives us a very plain record. Go to Genesis chapter 6 and 7 and 8. And God there describes exactly how the earth was destroyed by water. We don't have to guess. We don't have to speculate or philosophize. Uh, we, we, we read in Genesis 1 how God created the earth perfect. Everything was very good. We read in Genesis 3 how man fell into sin and the earth came under the curse of God. Uh, thorns and thistles would come forth. Then we read in Revelation or in Genesis 6 how man became exceedingly wicked and God destroyed that earth. And here in Second Peter 3, God is simply summarizing that. So we don't have to uh, speculate about what was that uh, earth before the flood. God had, gives us very, very clear uh, description of that. And, and we, we don't have to guess at all about that. God gives us, he, tell, he tells us that the waters came from the bowels of the earth and the windows of heaven and they rose 15 cubits above the highest mountain. My, talk about detail. It tells about the fact that, 
the, that the Noah was in the ark for a year and ten days. It tells about the fact that uh, that uh, uh, what kind of animals were in the ark and and uh, so on, and, and even tells us where the ark landed and Mount Ararat and and so forth. God gives us all kinds of detail, so that's where you better uh, build your context from. Yeah, but, maybe I'm doing yeah. a very good job of making my point. Okay, what I'm pointing out is I'm, I'm well aware of the con of you know the uh, story in Genesis, an account of Noah. But what I'm pointing out is in Second Peter three, Peter speaking by inspiration of the Holy Spirit is saying that there was an earth that was prior to the earth that the apostle Peter was in at that time, and that that earth had perished. Well, excuse me, excuse me, but you see, we compare Scripture with Scripture. And the minute you read that, you say, oh, I see. Well, then I better start looking in the Bible to see if there's any other information. And so if we don't, you can't make a case just looking at Second Peter 3 if there's a lot of other information in the Bible that relates to it. And so when the moment we start reading the first eight chapters of Genesis, then Second Peter 3, about the earth about perishing in that day, all of it makes all kinds of sense. Immediately we understand what he is saying. We don't have to think of some mysterious earth that existed sometime in the past and then it was destroyed by water. We don't exactly know what it was. We know exactly what it was. God gives us the precise detail. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes. I wanted to find out if the church age is over, where do we pay our tithes? Oh, well, you see, the task, why, why do we give tithes? The, or why do we give our offerings? Uh, the, the task of the church, throughout the church age, the dominant task was to get the gospel out in the world. Remember Jesus told the apostles that when he went back to heaven, go ye into all the world with the gospel. And elsewhere he has indicated that the believers are, are uh, ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, we have the task of declaring this gospel to the world. And so we give our offerings in order that that task might be done. And ordinarily, the, the uh, task had been centered upon the churches and congregations. They, they particularly had been given that mandate that, uh, that, that was their main uh, task to do. But if the church age is over, the task of sharing the gospel is not over. There's verses like, for example, Jesus said, Occupy until I come. Or he used the figure, you know, those who are on the housetop remain there. And the housetop, other verses show us, have to do with uh, being in a place where we can get the gospel out. And so we continue to bring our offerings uh, to uh, those organizations or uh, those uh, w wherever the we uh, were able to get the gospel out into the world. That has to continue, getting the gospel out. And that's why we read in Revelation 7, in verse 9, After this I saw a great multitude, which no man can number, that came out of great tribulation. It's because people continue to give their offerings so that the gospel can go out. And you, you, you can't bring your offering to a church, but you can certainly bring your offering, let's say, to an organization like Family Radio that is in the business, the sole business, of getting the gospel out into the world. That's our only business, is getting the gospel out into the world. Thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Wait, wait, wait. No, you can't. Hang on. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, good evening. Um, I'd like to ask a question, but I also have a comment. Yes. Okay. My, um, I'm a Catholic. And I have a huge problem with your constantly discussing 
um, problem with the Catholic and how we take away from the doctrine and we're not faithful. Um, there's a lot of comments that you make about the Catholics that I think are untrue and they need to be straightened out because I personally am Syrian and I'm very faithful to the word and we're very decent people and we're not all people that change the word and go different ways. Well, excuse me, if you listen to this program, you will find that uh, if someone is offering a, a Roman Catholic doctrine that is wrong, I will say it is wrong. If they're offering a Protestant church doctrine that is wrong, I will say it is wrong. I will. Say, I, I, I don't. I'm. I don't discriminate at all. The, uh, all I'm interested in is truth. Is truth. Now the problem is whether you're a Protestant or a Roman Catholic or whatever a person is. If we happen, if you happen to hold a doctrine that that now the host of the open program is saying is wrong, then you're uncomfortable because you don't like criticism. I can understand that. You feel offended by that. But that's the problem of truth. That's the problem with this program. This program is not a place where anybody is being buttered up. Anybody is, is being talked to nicely in order to placate them or to, uh, to uh, make them feel good. The, the purpose of this program is truth. Now, uh, I, maybe at times I'm not quite as kind as patient, as uh, as uh, tender as I could be, although I'll tell you before I begin this program each day, I, each night I pray, oh Lord, may I be tender and may I be kind, but sometimes maybe I'm not, and I, I please forgive me for that. But the fact is, the intent of the program is truth, and I know that truth offends uh, it, 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 that's why there are a lot of parts of the Bible people will not read. They, they like to read passages that talk about the love of God, but what about the passages that speak about the wrath of God and the fact that He is a jealous God and that He will pour His fury out on those who rebel against Him? We don't like those, but they, that's part of the Word of God, and they have to be declared right along with the others. Okay, I, I understand what you're saying, okay, and, and a lot of things I, I can agree with, okay. There are a few things, but and that's in any church, okay, and, and I would say even the church that you must follow, there must be some things that you don't agree with, but because you personally are faithful, I think that the Lord will judge you. And I am faithful, and so are most of my family. We're well, very I, but excuse me, let me interject something here. The issue, and this is a very important point, the issue is not faithfulness to our church. The issue is faithfulness to the Bible. Because the church is not the authority. The church is not God. The church can't save us. Only God can save us. And, and that is the, the real issue. Hold on, I'll be right back with you right after this message. Each weekday at this time, we bring you Open Forum, a telephone talk program airing questions on biblical issues. This feature of Family Stations Incorporated will continue in just a moment. What is the covenant of salt? Who are covenant breakers? And what does it mean to be a covenant family? The Bible talks a lot about this word, and in today's public policy-making circles, it's gaining new popularity. But what is the meaning of the word covenant in the Bible? The scriptures frequently refer to a promise our Lord made with his people a long time ago. The study, God's Covenant of Grace, examines this covenant and how it shapes our lives today. The booklet, God's Covenant of Grace, is free. So please, take a moment and call Family Radio for the special study, The Gospel, God's Covenant of Grace. Our toll-free number is 1-800-543-1495. 
That's 1-800-543-1495. We continue with more of the open forum. You are invited to call in and ask questions or discuss issues that are related to the Bible. Our number is 1-800-322-5385. That's 1-800-322-5385. When your call goes on the air, please be ready to turn your volume down. Here is our host and Bible teacher, Harold Camping. We must remember that the prime issue facing mankind today and at any time in the past, the prime issue is not how faithful are we to the church that we belong to, but how faithful are we, are, are we to the word of God. What finally is the ultimate authority? Is it our church or is it the Bible? And that that is a question that everyone in the protestant denominations have to face in the roman catholic denomination in the greek orthodox in any any denomination you want to name the real issue is what is the ultimate authority what who finally gets us into heaven does the church do that the answer is no no the church can't save anybody the church cannot save anybody. No pastor, no priest, no elder, no deacon, no uh, whatever title he may have can get anybody saved. Only God can save, and he is the one that we have to answer to, and he does all the work in saving us. The work of the church throughout the church age was to be the custodian of the Bible. That is, to it had the task of sharing the Bible with others, but it was God who had to do the saving, and it was God who was the final authority, not the church. And thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Yes. Hi, uh, Brother Camping. I have a couple questions. First of all, I'm um, I'm married, and this is my first marriage, but it's my husband's third marriage. And right now I'm separated, and we were trying to work it out. But we're not working it out anymore, and now he's dating someone else. What do I do now? Well, this is your marriage, and uh, if he divorces you, you are not to divorce him because uh, uh, you are married to him and you are married to him as long as he lives and you live but if he divorces you then you are to remain single if you are going to be faithful to the word of god this is the only marriage that uh, that god will allow you to have in this uh, on this earth and uh, if that is if you're going to be faithful to the word of god i want to i have a i i have i'm having a difficult time with it because as i said this is my first marriage i've never gotten married before and i never got married because i wanted to be forever i never wanted to break a commitment but now i don't know what to do because well I, you, you know i feel like i've been abandoned but now what well what now what is that first of all you married when you should not have married if this was his third marriage you that already should have been a warning to you that he is not very faithful to his wife these two other wives that came ahead of you that he wasn't faithful at all to so how could you expect him to be faithful to you but okay you got married it was a, it was a wrong marriage but it's still a marriage and uh, and and now if he divorces you, now the issue is, are you going to continue to go your way, or are you going to start doing it God's way? When you got married him, you were going your way, not God's way, because had you been going God's way, you never would have married him, because he had already had two other wives. But, but at some point, you have to decide, uh, who am I following? My own ideas, my own uh, impulses, my own uh, feelings? Or am I going to, going to begin to follow God? And, uh, and so if he divorces you, is this, 
okay, Lord, uh, I, I, I've learned my lesson. I went my own way, and I, my, my life messed up, and now I'm going to do it your way. And if it means I have to remain single the rest of my life, so be it. Uh, all I want to do is do it God's way. Well, that's what I'm trying to do. But am I supposed to stay married now? Well, what do you mean, stay married? If he divorces you, you can't stay married. If, as long as you're not divorced, you, he's still your husband, and you can try to affect a reconciliation. But the likelihood is, from what you're telling me about him, if he's already dating someone else, it means that eventually he'll divorce you and marry another. He'll have his fourth marriage. This, this is, this is his way of life. But that's his sin. That's you don't want to become part of his sin. And so if he divorces you, then you continue in uh, in doing it God's way by remaining single. Married but single, you mean? Pardon? Married but single, you mean? Well, you're married in principle to him, but you but in in another sense you're you you have to live uh, outside of that marriage. And and if he marries someone else, then you can't never become one flesh with him again. My second question is, I'm, I, I don't know the Bible well, and I'm trying to read it. How do, go, how do I go about reading it? Well, What's the best, the best way, way to start? Well, first of all, read it. In other words, I, don't get uh, traumatized because of the size of the Bible or the difficult language. Start reading it. Uh, start in Genesis chapter 1 and, and read it slowly and carefully. I always read with a pen or a pencil in my hand, so if I run across a statement or a verse that I'd like to remember and I, I want to make sure I can find it again, I underline it or I put a big X in the margin or uh, some other way of identifying so that later on I know, oh, I know, I read about that someplace back here in this book. Now, where was it? And as I thumb from page to page, I'll, I'll see what I underlined, and I, I'll, oh, there it is. That, that's the one that I was looking for. That's, uh, and, uh, and then read, uh, start reading the New Testament. Read the Old Testament for a while, and, and then the New Testament. But, but the important thing is read it, and, and, and don't read it. Don't feel like a hero because you spent 15 minutes reading the Bible. Spend an hour reading the Bible and just carefully. And as you're reading, reading, pray, Oh, Lord, help me to have a little understanding of this. And, Oh, Lord, help me to be obedient to what I find there. Now, a lot what you read you won't understand because the Bible was not written to be easily understood. But now and then, a phrase or a verse will pop out at you, and you'll say, Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that was in the Bible. Underline it so you can find it again. Also, as you listen to a program like this, and you hear a question about something, and a, and a verse is offered. In Philippians 2, verse 13, we read thus and so. Well, write that Write that citation down, and then in your spare time, look it up and see once what it says, and and get acquainted with that uh, that particular verse, and and uh, this way uh, that also will encourage you to read the Bible more. I have um, a problem where I'm struggling with leaving the church. I mean, lately I haven't been going. I, I was a Catholic, like the lady that called earlier. I was a Catholic. I was a Catholic for a long time, and it was. And then I started going to um, a non-denominational Bible study church. And now, am I? You you talk about fellowshipping. I don't know if that's a. I mean, I guess you're saying all churches, any churches, we're not supposed to be attending. Well, according to what I read in the Bible, we're not supposed to be, and. And uh, you you have a prior problem, of course, and that is, uh, you you uh, you want to know that you have become a child of God. Now the church can't save you. Nobody can. No human can save you. Uh, but you can. You should be praying. Oh Lord, have mercy. Have mercy. Be uh, you have that that luxury of uh, making your requests known to the Lord. That won't get you saved. But and also. 
Uh, you know, uh, you've learned perhaps that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God so that the environment in which God will save you if he plans to save you, and I don't know if he does or not, neither do you know whether he plans to or not, but uh, if he does, it'll be uh, through reading the word of God or hearing the word of God. So spend a lot of time in the word of God. That's And uh, that's the first thing you want to be doing in your spare time and on, when Sunday rolls around and, and you're trying to observe Sunday, read the Bible, read the Bible, and listen to family radio programming because that can be an encouragement and, and give you some direction as to what the Bible is saying. I actually listen to you guys every single day, every day, every night. And um, like I said, the one thing I'm struggling with now is the church. And like I said, it's not a church per se, but it is a Bible study in, I guess, what you would call a church. But it's not, I can't, I guess, it's well, not it's really a, like a mass. It's only a church if it's sponsored by a church. That is, if the one who is teaching is there because he has been sent there by a church, then it's under the direction of the church, and then that is not the place where you ought to be. But on the other hand, you may you may hear of another group of people that, or another individual or two who are have a fellowship going that is not sponsored by a church, and that would be a, a more healthy place to be. But okay. th thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Okay, hi, Brother Kevin. Let me turn down my radio. Yes. Um, I have a question about, um, I've been studying the uh, amillennial, premillennial um, situation, debate, or whatever, what have you, and uh, I've been following a lot of studies, and I really see... Um, how the amillennial position is really uh, scripturally based, but there's one scripture I'm really struggling with, and maybe you could help me out. It's Ezekiel, in Ezekiel 36, yes. where it says, uh, "For I will take you uh, out of the nations, and I will gather from all countries and bring you back into your own land." Now, I don't know if you studied Ezekiel 36, but can you give me some shed some light on that? Well, yes, the land that God has in view in Ezekiel 36 and 37 is the kingdom of God. Jump ahead a chapter to Ezekiel 37, and uh, as it's talking about uh, uh, this that, uh, that is uh, initially talked about in chapter 36, verse 24 of Ezekiel 37, And David, my servant, shall be king over them, that's not King David uh, of the Old Testament, that's Christ. The word David means beloved, uh, and Christ is the beloved one. Uh, uh, so that we could paraphrase this and say, Christ, my servant, shall be king over them, and they all shall have one shepherd. And remember Jesus came saying, I am the good shepherd, and my sheep hear my voice and so on. They'll have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. That is the word of God. And they shall dwell in the land. There you have that land again. That I have given unto Jacob my servant. Now here's another name for Christ. Is, uh, is the, the name Jacob. He's typified by Jacob of the Old Testament. Wherein your fathers have dwelt, and they shall dwell therein. That is, the land was typified by the land of Canaan, but in actuality it is the kingdom of God. And we'll know this as we go on in this verse, because it says, And they shall dwell therein, I'm looking at verse 25 of Ezekiel 37, and they shall dwell therein, even they and their children and their children's children, forever, forever. Now, there's no land on the face of this present earth that will exist forever. Because as we looked at earlier at Second Peter 3, this whole world is going to be destroyed by fire. So what kind of a land could it be where David will be king forever and will dwell there forever? Oh, it is the kingdom of God that was typified by the land of Canaan, uh, that was typified by by uh, Jerusalem and Judah and Judea and so on. And so it says, 
They, we will dwell there forever, and my servant David shall be their prince forever. Christ will be our king forever, you see. Yep, you just cleared that up for me. See, I was looking for the word forever, and then now that I see it, I understand it now. Because I see in Isaiah, I'm reading through some premillennial stuff and how they defend their position. And, and many of them I looked at, and I'm like, well, it says forever. But well, it's interesting, like... you know, the premillennial position uh, had some things right, and they had some things wrong. The all-millennial position had some things right, and they had some things wrong. The all-millennial position was right in that there's no future thousand-year reign of Christ, but they were wrong in thinking that the church age would continue right till the very end, although that is not a dominant uh, piece of uh, uh, part of the all-male position. The all-millennial position is dominantly focused on the fact that there, that Christ will come, uh, uh, that there will be no future thousand-year reign of any kind or any glorious age like that in the future but uh, but the premillennial position were they were right about some things they for example saw that there would be an end of the church age and that that end would come at the beginning of the, the great tribulation of uh, Matthew 24 they were right about that except that they were wrong as to how the church age would end they had the idea that it would end because all the believers would be raptured. They'd all, all be caught up to be with the Lord in the air. And, uh, and yet this world would continue. Uh, they, they're right about that, they're, that the, there was to be an end of the church age, but the end is not coming because the believers are raptured. It's because they are driven out or commanded to come out of the churches. They were right in that this moment of time when this would happen is identified with the beginning of the Great Tribulation of Matthew 24. Then they were also right about the fact that during that Tribulation time there would be Jews bringing the Gospel all over the world. But they were wrong in which Jews they were. They were thinking of the nation of Israel, the blood descendants of Abraham. And that, that, that isn't the nation that was to be bringing the gospel during the Great Tribulation. It is the, it, uh, 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 the Jews are the ones who are the true believers, the Israel of God. They who are the spiritual seed of Abraham. That is everyone who has truly become saved. They are to bring the gospel and that's what we're doing in Family Radio. Then they also were right about the fact that at the end of the tribulation, Christ would come. And, uh, and uh, they were right about that. Now, they were wrong about uh, what he would do when he would come. They, they thought he would come here and set up a throne for a thousand years. But they were right in that he would come. And that's true. At the end of, a, of the tribulation, Christ will be here. And, but he's, it'll be a time of the judgment and the end of the world, not the time of setting up a, a millennial kingdom of some kind. So they had a lot of truth and a lot of error, and the Omnial position had a lot of truth and some error. And now, by God's mercy, because we're at the end, or very near the end, and it's the time when God is opening our spiritual eyes to a lot of things that he has not opened previously to those who studied the Bible, we're beginning to sort this out and beginning to see exactly how it is developing. As a matter of fact, we're living in that time, so not only do we read it in the Bible to see how it will develop, but then we look out in the world and, and in the churches and so on, and we say, yes, yes, it's going along just exactly that way, exactly the way the Bible predicted it would go. Question. Um, I understand that we can do nothing to save ourselves. That is totally a work of God. Are you yes. still there? Yes. Okay. Um, but there are two uh, verses in Scripture which I'm having trouble with. One is in Jude, um, verse, and I'll say both Scriptures, and I'll, I'll let you go ahead and answer. One is in Jude, uh, chapter, uh, um, Jude, verse uh, 22, 23. Be merciful to those who doubt, snatch others from the fire, and save them. And the second one is in 1 Corinthians, uh, chapter 9. 
uh, verse 19. Now, again, I understand that we don't, we can't do anything to save other pe- other people. But Paul says, um, or Paul was saying, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, uh, I make myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. They come a Jew to win the Jews, uh, you know, and so on. I'm sure you're familiar with that scripture. Can you shed some light on that? Well, yes. You see, uh, uh, we. Uh, are the custodians of the Word of God. God has given the Word, the Bible, to the believers uh, with the mandate that they are to share it with the world. And it is the Word of God by which people are snatched from the fires of hell. It is the Word of God where, uh, where, uh, whereby people can become saved. And we not only are not only by our uh, uh, sharing the word, but also by our lifestyle, we we become the fragrance of Christ. As people look at us, they say, "Oh, is that what a Christian is?" And uh, that can encourage them in the word. But but it is the word that is applied to the hearts of the individuals to cause them to become saved. But because we have been assigned the task of bringing that word to them, we become very closely identified with those who are becoming saved. But nevertheless, no matter how closely we're identified, we have to keep a separation that finally it is God who has done all the work of saving and we have simply been humble servants that have been uh, stewards of the word and making sure that it is present there. And it is God who snatches out of the fire. It is God who finally saves anybody. So much, Brother Camping. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes. Um, um, the baby crying, uh, uh, Mr. Gaffin, can, can I just close my bedroom door? Uh, um, um, just a minute. I'm sorry, go ahead with your call. Mr. Gaffin? Good evening, welcome to Open Forum. Uh, 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 Mr. Gaffin? Yes. How you do, sir? Fine, thank you. Good, good. Um, it's a, it's a blessing to be able to, um, to, just to be able to talk to you. Yes, I was wondering, um... I think it's First Corinthians, the um, the the twelfth twelfth chapter. I think about the thirteenth verse, where it talks about we are buried into the body, which is we are baptized into the body, which is the church. Now I know bap- baptism is, is 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 not a literal. I mean, as far as um, just going into the water, washing wash away your sins, but as far as the church. The eternal church that um, Acts two, I think two forty seven talks about, in, in regard to praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Yes. Now is is at least I'm I'm having doubts about this congregation that I'm affiliated with now since I've been kind of you know um, studying this. Uh, comparing to um, baptized baptism and scriptures yeah. that to be baptized into the body is the church that don't mean that if you go get baptized submerged in water that's the way you get into the eternal church because this is what this congregation is teaching yes well see that's uh, that that's because there is a um, a, a desire on the part of people to be equal to God or like God. We did it. We are in charge. We have that authority. Now, first of all, the word baptize, normally, unless it specifically talks about baptism in water, like when the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts 8 just said, here is water, what's to prevent me from being baptized? Ordinarily, when the Bible talks, use the word baptize, it is not talking about water baptism. The word baptize means to wash or to cleanse. And if we, and, and, in order to become saved, we have had to have our sins washed away. Therefore, the body that is here is not the local congregation. It is not the local congregation. It is the body of those who have had their sins washed away. 
It is only the true believers within that congregation. Now, it's true during the church age, most of the true believers are found within the congregation, but under no circumstance could we ever believe that every member of a church is part of the eternal body, that is, that their sins are washed away. Many times it's only a tiny remnant of the whole congregation that really have become saved. But once we are, our sins are washed away, then we are one body. And that doesn't mean that, uh, that we're all in one congregation. We're one body with, uh, we're in the body of Christ, which consists of true believers wherever they are found throughout the world. That is the body that we have entered into. We have been all made to drink into one spirit. The, the drink, uh, that is, we have drunk of the gospel of the Lord Jesus and, and, uh, and the Holy Spirit has indwelt us now and, and we are a part of that eternal body. But the church has seen fit to look at these kind of phrases as speaking about water baptism and that the local congregation now is the, the body and that effectively we're all true believers therefore and effectively then this congregation is the bride of Christ and and so on and they make no uh, delineation they don't uh, they don't make a difference at all between the eternal church and the external church because really they're one and the same since they believe that all the members are true believers but you see, no church can get anybody saved. Only God can save. And only God knows who the true believers are in, who are uh, within any congregation. He, only God knows the ones who have been washed. That is, their sins have been washed away. They are baptized into Christ. So, am I biblically on the right road when I disagree with the pastor as far as in, in Bible study when he say you have to be baptized to get into Jesus church the church that he promised to build over there in Matthew 16 18 well yeah. I disagree with that that you have to be baptized as far as going underwater yeah, well that but you see uh, your pastor is typical of a lot of pastors. They believe that it's the work that the church does and that the outward observances that you do in the church that gets you saved. And that is an authority that the church has usurped from God. It's an authority that, that they should not have. But I have to say good night now because we've run out of time. I'm sorry we can't visit longer. Until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you. Good night. Family Stations Incorporated has featured Open Forum a telephone talk program of biblical discussion with host Harold Camping. You're invited to tune in every weekday at this time. All correspondence relating to the Open Forum should be sent to Family Stations Incorporated, Oakland, California, 94621. That's Family Stations Incorporated, Oakland, California, 94621. When writing, please indicate the call letters of this station. If you were not able to call in on this broadcast, we invite you to try again on a future open forum. Due to the nature of this type of call-in program, the opinions expressed are those of the participants. Open Forum is a production of Family Stations.